but for me, uh, at that time, me and all my friends and the people I hung around with had started gravitating toward uh, drugs and alcohol. And that desire to preach and to do something big for God just kind of, it wasn't a moment where it shifted for me and said, you know what, I want anything to do with God. It was a, it was a slow fade, as they say. It's just kind of forgotten. Um, excuse me, I need to throw some of that. I guess you guys don't want to watch me shoot my gun But then, as I did that for 15 years, uh, lived that life and did that thing, and uh, <coughs> found myself on suicide watch in Elkhart, or Kosciuszko County Jail, um, kind of came to myself and I was like, you know what, maybe this isn't so fun anymore. And I started rebuilding that thing that God had put in me. Uh, I started coming to church. It's actually been six years ago <coughs> this week, I think, either last week or this week, six years uh, since I came to my first service at New Life Christian Church in World Outreach and then went to a football game that evening and played uh, a crazy 30-30 flag football game um, that we don't do anymore because it got too violent after a few years. Uh, but I was hooked, and I said, yep, this is what I want. And I saw uh, Pastor Lowe on stage, and he reminded me so much of that big Baptist preacher. He just captivated you and brought, had your attention, and everybody you know, honored him and respected him. I said, yeah, this is it. And so that began me rebuilding that thing in my life. Um, it, was, it was funny. This is the second time now that I've been planning a message where while I'm planning it, someone posts something on Facebook that contradicts my message completely. I hate that. Um, I'm talking about doing something great for God. And someone posted on Facebook the other day, we shouldn't ask what great thing we can do for God, but what great thing God can do through us. I'm like, hmm. all right. You know, it's, I think sometimes in the name of putting a quote on Facebook, we kind of split some hairs that don't need to be split. Um, yes, God does it through us. Yes, we allow God to work through us. But man, who doesn't want to, what Christian doesn't want to do something big for God? You know, I mean, that's kind of what we're here for, is to do something for God. So, um, Nehemiah 6.15. This is the end of the story that we're looking at. It's not the end of Nehemiah's story, but it's the end of this part of the story. And it says in uh, verse 15, it says, So the wall was com completed on the 25th day of El in 52 days. We serve a supernatural God who we don't even, I mean, honestly comprehend. I, I study this word and I, I look at commentaries and I, I know some word and I know what it means. But to comprehend the fact that God stands outside of time and space. He's always been, will always be. And our puny human minds can't even wrap ourselves around that. But the superhuman God will give us thoughts and ideas. Sometimes we think that God can only work in our lives by, you know, dropping something in our life. You know, we need money, so he drops a check in our mailbox out of the blue but instead he usually uses ideas that he places in our heads and he allows us to do things for him and with his help it happens in a supernatural way in a supernatural time frame six years six years I've gone from setting on suicide watch to standing up here I that's only God and people can argue philosophy and theology and Bible and try to twist words, but nobody can argue your story. Nobody can argue with me that I, you just decided to quit drinking and drugging. I decided that 150 times before I came here and turned my life back to God. I decided it every day of my life, and then five minutes later I was picking up a bowl and smoking another one. I mean, it wasn't my decision. It was me surrendering my life to God. He's a supernatural God. 
Verse 16 says, And when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. This is what God wants. I mean, this is, this is what I want for my life. This is what I want for my kids' lives. This is what I want for this church and this ministry. To do something so big that people just have to look at it and say, it's, it's got to be God. Um, the person that was supposed to be here tonight, I knew her from before. You know, before. My before life. And we were good friends, and I basically lived at her and her uh, boyfriend's house. And we spent a lot of time together, all three of us, uh, when I was away from my family and leaving my kids and my wife at home while I was out having fun. And a few years had gone by since then, and we'd lost touch, and I'd lost touch with my other friend. And um, I'm at the bar one night, and I see her. Well, that night, when I see her, I'm covered in my own urine. And even in that inebriated, highly inebriated state, I was so embarrassed. So mortified that I would see someone that I know. And I don't even know if she remembers this at all. We just recently uh, caught each other on Facebook. But I, I couldn't believe it. And for her to see me now, and where I'm at, and what I'm doing, and who I'm helping, and the people I talk to, and the people that want to talk to me, she has no choice but to attribute it to God. Because she's seen me at my worst. I've never seen a wall rebuilt in 52 days. But I've seen my life and my marriage um, go through a miraculous transformation. A city wall is nothing compared to my marriage. You know, me rebuilding my marriage is the single biggest thing that I could do for God. After that, it's all kind of icing on the cake. Um, because by rebuilding my marriage and allowing God to do that, I've saved my kids' lives. I mean, six years later, I don't know where my son would be at 15, going on 15 right now. If I was, st I, I wouldn't be alive, really, I know that. But for him to be fatherless and uh, dealing with that in his life, man or my daughter, you know, at 11 years old. I, I can't imagine. So getting ourselves right for ourselves and for our family is the biggest thing we can do. But it doesn't stop there. So I want to look at uh, four, four ways, four reasons, four questions we have to ask ourselves if we really want to do something for God. And, hey, we're all at different places. We're at different places in our recovery, we're different places uh, spiritually. We're different places in our faith and our belief. Um, that's the tough thing about the Celebrate Recovery thing is um, it's got to be Christ-centered. That's the whole point. That's why we are here. That's why we're Celebrate Recovery. That's the, the cornerstone of it is it's Christ-centered. So the, the tricky thing is that you don't know where everybody is in their spirituality. You know when you're coming to a church service you're going to get preached to. That's what they do at church. Well, this is kind of on the edge of, well, is it AA? Is it church? What do we, you know, we just sang people raising their hands. Um, it'll always be Christ-centered. Um, I hate that some people won't come back. We've had a few people that's been here for their first time when I've been standing up here. Haven't seen them since. I don't know why. I don't know if time thing got in the way. Or if it was, you know what, I really don't want that much God in my recovery. It's the only true way to recover. Mm -hmm. I know that. Four ways, four questions we have to answer to be used greatly by God. Hey, we're in recovery. We need something to do. Uh, personal inventory I did last time, I talked about keeping a journal. Uh, 
If you haven't started it, I would recommend it. It's huge. You see patterns. You see the reasons why you do the things you do. Um, but you, you need something to do. Then I taught on a... What's up, Bob? I taught about uh, when you feel empty inside and the four things you can do to fill yourself back up. We need things to do as people in recovery. Uh, a lot of spirituality and stuff like that is great and it's true and it's biblical, but we're trying to save our lives here. And it, all it takes is one little slip and we start all over again. And there's nothing, nothing more painful than feeling like you've walked 100 miles to find out that you're right back where you started or even 100 miles behind where you started. That sucks. So we've got to always be aware of what we're doing. Number one, will you embrace your misery and make it your ministry? Those two words, misery and ministry, kind of seem like they don't really go together. Um, I've been doing this, and not just standing on a stage and speaking, but speaking into people's lives individually on the, on the job or at church or different areas to know that there's misery that goes along with it. Uh, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. Which basically means if you're not doing anything, then you've got no crap to clean up. And that's the same thing with ministry. If, you're not, if there's not a certain amount of misery in your life because of the people you're ministering to, you're not doing enough. But not only that, there's misery that comes before you even start your ministry. And that's going to lead you to what your ministry is. There's things that breaks your heart that will lead you to think, maybe that's my ministry. Nehemiah chapter 1. We'll go back to the beginning. Verse 1 says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned, questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. All right, a little backstory for all of us that are not Bible scholars. Israel is now in, was in captivity, right? Jeremiah came along, told them many, many years, you guys are going to, going to go into captivity. You're not listening, you're not doing what God says. 77 years you're going to be in captivity. So they were taken away. So now the... Uh, Persians have come along and kicked the Babylonians out. Persians said, you know what, if you guys want to go back to your homeland, you can't. And I guess uh, one commentary says 50,000 of them went back into their homeland, like 2%. The rest of them stayed in the Persian Empire. Because the Persians were really nice to them, actually. This is the whole time where uh, Esther comes along, you know, and once she stands up for them, and uh, Xerxes, you know, steps up. It's kind of smooth sailing. You know, they're not really held in captivity. They're just living there, just like Jeremiah told them to do. So this is Nehemiah asking his brothers what's going on back there. And verse 3 says, They said to me, Those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So they had gone back. Uh, Zerubbabel took them back. They went back with Ezra. Ezra was a priest. So they started um, setting up the, the law again, which is what they were supposed to do. Problem is, they weren't worried about the city wall. So every time they kind of started to rebuild it a little bit, someone would come in and tear it down again. They were worried about the godly things, but they weren't worried about the practical things. And Nehemiah heard this, and he was very distraught. 
He sat down and wept. What's your burden in your life? What keeps you awake at night? And I'm not talking about your bills and your job and all that other stuff that keeps a lot of us awake at night. I'm talking about the stuff deep down inside of you that causes you misery. What caused me misery was the fact that I knew that I wanted to be a preacher. Like I said, when I was young and I wanted to do this, you all know what a cassette recorder is? Big box like this big, slide a tape in there, it's got big buttons like this big and you push it to record. Well, me and my sister and my uncle, we were all, my sister is a year and a half older than me, my uncle is a year older than me, so we were kind of like cousins and brothers and sisters and stuff. We would sit around and record stupid stuff. You know, we thought we were funny, but I'd hate to listen to it now. That'd be some awful, awful stuff. But I would slip away by myself because I was a prodigy in memorizing Bible verses in Awanas. And I would slip by, slip away by myself and I would record myself preaching. I didn't know what I was talking about. I was just spitting out Bible verses and, you know, whatever the the big Baptist preacher would say, and I'd record myself, and I'd listen to it, and then I'd erase it, because I didn't want anybody else hearing it. But that's, that's what I wanted to do, and I, it caused me misery that I wanted to do that at such a young age, and I missed out on it. And then I, I started listening to podcasts. Podcasts were amazing to me. All the sermons in the world that you ever wanted to listen to, you could listen to them, and I could wear headphones at work. Still can, and I listen to podcasts all day long. And then people started coming and asking me questions about stuff. And my misery really was that people knew Jesus, and they had heard the name Jesus, and they knew there was a God, but they had no clue of how to access the power in your life. They didn't even know there was power. They knew there was a Jesus and they knew there was a God. But people have no clue of what that really means in their life. They have no clue that they can rebuke things. And they can cast down thoughts that they don't have to sit around for weeks thinking about, I want a drink. I want a drug. I didn't know it. Even growing up in church, when I was in my Addiction, I had no idea what I was doing. And that caused me such misery. And when they started talking about doing this thing, <laughs> was anyone here when uh, Peter Daniels was here? Rich guy from Australia? Like one of the richest guys in the world. Yeah? Yeah, I think I was. He brought me up on stage. And I stood up. He was picking people. He was picking like four people out. And I was shaved bald at the time, and so I think I kind of glowed. And uh, he picked me to come up on stage. And as soon as I stood up, it was like, God, I've never had a full-blown vision. But that's as close as I've had of God telling me that I would run a faith-based recovery center in this area to challenge the Bowen Center and all these for-profit recovery centers that want your cash and give you nothing in return. Nothing really tangible. They'll tell you you're an addict. They'll tell you you're an alcoholic. And they'll tell you how it works and what it does. But nothing like Jesus. They'll tell you there's really nothing you can do to change your circumstance. All you can do is try to maintain and not drink. Well, that doesn't work. I know. And so God dropped that in my heart. And that was, it still sometimes causes me misery that I haven't moved toward what I thought he was giving me. I see, has anyone seen the uh, commercial for Passages Malibu? That's my place. That's what I was expecting when God told me he was going to give me a faith-based Christian recovery center. I'm like, yeah, that's it right there. I'm thinking uh, mercy ministry for men. There are some, and they're good. Um, 
There's one in Tennessee up on the mountains. You've got nothing but you, God, counselors in the mountain. And it's, it works. You separate yourself from the world and get with God and yourself and be true to yourself and uh, godly people leading you in that. And you can come out of this junk. That's what caused me menis- misery. And that's what led to me doing this. Um, there's people that are burdened. That's really what we're talking about. The misery is a burden in your life. It's something you just can't shake. There's people like that about the poor. Now, we're all human. And we know that it's not good to be poor. And you go through Indianapolis or even Mishawaka, some places, Elkhart, and you see people that are poor. And it, there's something in you that says that's not right. But it doesn't burden you the way it did Mother Teresa. I mean, she gave up her entire life. She, she decided to make herself poor to help the poor. I mean, that's a burden, and that was a ministry, and she was world-changing. And I mean, you can't say, everybody knows who Mother Teresa was. Because she had a burden in her life. Uh, there's people that are burdened over um, people being bullied. You know, I, you don't know what that burden really is until you get alone and start. I mean, you, you have something in your heart, but, you know, what does this mean for me? That's the first step. Making your misery your ministry. Finding out what you want to change. Because that's what we're called to do, is change the world. I mean, that's, you can't understate what Christians are called to do. We're called to turn the world upside down. We're not called to come in and sit in a, a church seat every Sunday, turn around, walk out, and forget the people that you sat with. We all forget the message we heard. pastor said that on Sunday. Even he forgets the message he preached as soon as he walks away. But you can't forget the people that you set beside. That's the whole point. You take a little bit of the message, apply it to your life, and help the people beside you. Question number two. Will you exchange your comfort for your calling? At the end of chapter one, there's a weird sentence from verses five through ten 5 through 11, Nehemiah goes on to to make one of the most impassioned prayers in all of Scripture. I suggest you read it sometime. But then at the end of verse 11, it says, let me look, I don't have it here, but I want to look at it. I don't want to misquote it. Nehemiah 1, 11. I was cupbearer to the king. That's it. That's how it ends. It gives us passion prayer. And then it ends with, I was a cupbearer to the king. And then it starts in verse 2. And he goes on, and I'll read it in a second. But there was no good place to put that. It just kind of got added there. Cupbearer to the king. What's that mean? He brought him his wine. He was a trusted advisor. He was his closest advisor. He had a comfortable job. He was a Jew living in Persia with, if he wasn't the vice president, he was up there. And verse 1 says, (coughs) In the month of Nisan, that's right after the month of Toyota, before the month of Mitsubishi. Month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. King of Art, King Artaxerxes. That's the son of King Xerxes. Esther's husband. Her son, it would be actually her half-son, is now the king. 
That's why he has the place that he does. Because he remembered the Jewish people and what he had done for the kingdom. King Art Xerxes. When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. See, part of his job was to be happy. King don't want no sad faces in his court. You just cut your head off and get somebody else to bring you the wine. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. Courage isn't not being fearful. Courage is doing what you know you're supposed to do when you're afraid. Nehemiah had a choice right here, right now. He could kind of go, oh, I'm just a little depressed. Maybe you could bring me some, have the royal pharmacist bring me some prescription pills. It's no big deal. And he says, uh, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. So he's sucking up right now. Why should my face now look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried and lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? What is it you want in your life? What is it you want? You know how many times Jesus asked people, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? He's talking to a blind, crippled man. What do you want from me? What do you think I want from you, Jesus? I want to see and I want to be able to walk. But he still had to tell Jesus what you want. You have to tell him. You have to go to him in prayer. That's the way it works. That's the way this whole thing works is with prayer. If you want to be free, you have to tell him what you want. And make sure what you tell him what you want is actually what you want. Make sure you're ready for what you want. I wasn't. But he gave it to me anyway. Another thing is, make sure what you want is really good for your life. You know what I wanted at first? I wanted to be a functioning drinker, is what I wanted. It made me angry that other people could drink successfully. They could go to the bar and have a few beers. They could, they could even smoke pot and not get arrested. That's what I wanted. God didn't want me to have that at all. Tell him what you want. And then I prayed to the God of heaven. Good idea. He didn't have much time. Just quick little prayer. God help me. Give me the words. And I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, Ask me, how long will your journey take? And will, when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. He had a comfortable position. He could have spent the rest of his life bringing wine to the king. Nobody would have thought different about it. The wall may have been rebuilt, may not. Someone else could have come along and done it. But he was burdened, and he knew that God wanted to use him to do it. He prayed, if you look at these months, four months, he prayed and fasted to make sure this is what God wanted. See, because he still had stature in the kingdom. He could still do good things for God in the kingdom. But he wanted to make sure this is what God wanted him to do. Four months he prayed. And God said, I want you to do it. So he left his place of comfort and pursued his calling. That if there is a epidemic in the church today, and I'm just as sick as anyone else, it is we are stuck in our comfortable cultural Christianity. I will come in here and I will sit down and I will even possibly perchance raise my hand at a song just to show I'm surrendered. But don't ask me to look weird. Please. Some of us would rather go to hell 
today than look weird in front of somebody. Number one fear in life is public speaking. People would rather die than speak in front of people. I was there at a time myself. Now I don't care. I told God a long, God actually told me a long time ago, you don't get to say no to anybody asking you to speak. You want this? There you go. Whoever asks, you have to. So, we got to get out of our comfort zone. I, this is so weird. Today I'm, has anyone got a PlayStation 4 that pre-ordered that they could sell me? No. <laughs> I was driving around Goshen today, all of the stores, trying to find something, and I pull into uh, Walmart over in the north side of Goshen in the Elkhart area. And uh, as I'm pulling in the parking spot, I look over and there's a woman wailing like a professional Middle Eastern wailer at a funeral. And I'm like, what's going on over there? So I pull up into my spot and I kind of sit there for a minute and I figure, well, maybe if I slide out this way, she won't see that I saw her and we don't even have to, you know, make any eye contact or anything. And I get out and right there she is and she's crying and and her husband's sitting, or I guess it's her husband, sitting beside her, and he's just kind of going, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> so I walk toward Walmart, and I'm like, God, why? Why? All right. So I turn back around, and I go up to the guy's car, and I knock on the window, and he, he rolls down the window and says, yeah. Is everything all right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. She's just praying to Jesus Christ. All right. God bless you. And I walked away. I, she's just praying. She's, you know, some, some people wail when they pray. <laughs> I did not want to find out what that situation was all about. I, it could have gone any number of ways. But I had to step out of my comfort zone. Just Sunday morning, I'm standing on the front row. I'm in John Ryan's seat. Jeff Miller, one of my best friends in the entire world, is standing beside me. We're during, doing praise and worship. If you don't know Jeff, Jeff's got a bad back. He's basically got a broken back. And he works RV, and he's amazing. Um, and works through it to support his family. But uh, we're praising and singing, and I've got my hands up, and I'm surrendered to God. And I look over, and Jeff's down on one knee, and he's praying. Holy Spirit says, uh, why don't you put your hand on his back? God, I'm just trying to praise and worship here. I'm not trying to make a scene. And besides, what if I break his concentration? He's trying to praise. You know, I don't want to mess with him. Just put your hand on his back. So I sing a couple more verses. Uh, just pray for him. He's your best friend. You're in a freaking church where they lay hands on people, they pray for people, miracles happen. What are you worried about? Looking weird. They're all weird. <laughs> and I didn't do it. And the song finished and he stood up and I missed my moment. I was so, I was mad and I was ashamed a little. We have opportunities in our life every single day to step out of that comfort zone. Every day. Whatever your issue is, you have a chance to walk away from it every single time it comes up. Whether it's you know, drinking drugs, whether it's pornography, whatever it is, there is a moment where God calls you to step out of that comfort zone. Yes, I know it's a crutch. Yes, I know your body needs it. Just step out of it. Just come out of that comfort. It's amazing how easy it becomes after you do it the first time. But see, there's also a, a danger in that because what was once uncomfortable can become very comfortable. 
And once you start laying your hands on people and start praying for them, it becomes ritual almost. You're doing it with no faith. We were never, ever called to be comfortable. Never. All of the disciples were killed. I'm not asking you to go get martyred. I'm asking you to reach across the aisle, help a friend, pray for a friend. Stop and ask a crazy woman screaming in the middle of a Walmart parking lot, what's going on? Why are you screaming? Oh, you're praying, okay. It's all good. We're called to take, take up our cross is what we're called to do. That's our job. You will never, ever, ever do something for God if you just want to be comfortable. It will never happen. You will do small things. You'll get through in life. But you will never reach your God potential if you don't get uncomfortable. It's so huge for us. Number three. Will you put the wrong people out and let the right ones in? I'm talking about people in your life. Chapter 2, verse 11. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. You've got to get people around you that you trust, that you know have the same focus in life that you do. Jump down to verse 19. But when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. As important, and maybe more important, of bringing people alongside you is pushing the people out of your life that are wanting to hold you back. Because they're around and they'll tell you they love you and they do love you. A lot of people don't want to see us succeed because it reminds them how much they're not doing. Especially in a church situation. There will be people in the church they try to tell you to chill out, that you're doing too much, that you're doing it a little crazy, that you've never been to Bible school. You've got no reason standing up and talking to people. I just remind them the disciples never went to seminary either. You've got to get those people out of your life. And I'm not talking, see this is the thing, I'm not talking about drawing a circle around certain people and just ignoring them. Because we're not called to do that either. I'm talking about drawing a circle around your spirit. Not letting certain people affect that spirit. Love them. But don't let them affect your heart. Don't let them speak into your life. You know, if you're on fire for God, don't let someone tell you that you're too on fire for God. If they say that, that's the first clue that they're probably not looking out for your best well-being. It's a sacrifice. Uh, quote here says, you have to have the right voices to make the right choices. None of us know everything. None of us even know sometimes what's best for our own lives. We have to let people into our lives that love us and will speak into those lives. Number four, will you take your stand against the enemies of your God? Nehemiah 6, verse 1. When word came to Sambala, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, 
and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. Though up to that point I had not set the doors in the gate. He was almost done. He almost finished one part of what God had called him to do. You will meet the most resistance when you're close to doing what you're supposed to be doing. People will come against you when you're at the finish line. Sambala and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? We have to stand against our enemies. And sad to say, this world of church has our enemies so screwed up. Our enemies are not Buddhists. Our enemies are not Muslims. Our enemies are not homosexuals. Our enemies are no people. Our enemies, Satan, and ourselves. Our own flesh is our biggest enemy. That is the number one way our true enemy can get to us. By through, through our faults and our failures and our temptations. He laughs that we've got this so screwed up and we're looking at other people as our enemies. He thinks that's hilarious. Meanwhile, we're destroying our own lives by not doing the things that we know we're supposed to do. The point is, there are things as Christians we stand against. We stand against compromise. We stand against hypocrisy. We stand against judging people we don't think are on our level. There are just, we can't allow it. I hope and pray some of you sitting here will forgive my previous statements. Just trying to make a point. We cannot compromise and think that we're going to do something for God. He sends a message back. Four times these guys sent the same message. I can't go down. Why would I leave this work to come down and see you guys? I know what you want. We've got to do the same things with our flesh and the thoughts that come against us. Why would I stop doing what I'm doing for just a little bit of earthly pleasure? There is too much riding on it. I have literally, and you can... Say I'm overstating this if you want. There are literally lives hanging on whether the fact I stay sober or not. My life, my family life, and people around me. There are people watching and waiting for me to go drink. Just so they can say, see, it doesn't work. Why do I need to try? He'd been sober six years. Facebook every day, Jesus is, Jesus that. There's his name in the paper. I've got too much riding on this to let myself fall. Got to get in the Word every single day. That's kind of fanatical. Yep, it is. Jesus answered these questions with his life. Jesus' earthly ministry was all about misery. How many times does it say he was moved with compassion? 
for hurt, broken people. All he did was teach, preach, and heal people. Trying to change around the culture of his day. Saying, you guys are looking for this Messiah. I'm him. Pay attention. Won't you listen? You want to talk about giving up your comfort for your calling? Not not wanting to stop and talk to a woman in a Walmart parking lot. I should be ashamed of myself. Jesus Christ left the comfort of heaven to come down to this dirty, rotten world, knowing what he was going to go through when he left, knowing what he was going to do. But he had a calling. He had his ministry. He had to do it. And yeah, Jesus put the right ones around him and held the other ones off. Crazy thing is, you know the ones he had to hold out? The religious ones. He never once told a sinner, you can't come to me. Never once. He held his disciples close to him. And in his most important moments, he had Peter, James, and John. I love you other disciples, but me and these guys, we got to go do something. You guys got a little bit, little bit too much unbelief. We got to go do something right now. We'll come back. He had his close, close circle that he took with him. <laughs> and he definitely stood against the enemies of God. He stood against Satan in temptation. He stood against Peter several times. He said, get behind me, Satan. Because Peter didn't want him to go to the cross. He didn't want him to fulfill his calling. He loved him too much. It's like, Jesus, this is just a little too much. You're starting to talk about dying now. I don't, we don't like this. He told Peter, if you don't wash my feet, you've got no part in me. You've got to learn to serve, Peter. And he stood against the ultimate enemy, death. The only reason we're sitting here today, the only reason 2,000 years later we're still talking about this guy, is he conquered the enemy of God, and that's death. To give us eternal life. Let's pray. Sorry. Anybody need prayer out there? She bounced. Let's pray and we'll close this out. As we go into small group. If you remember nothing else, try to remember at least the four points. I'll try to remember them. Maybe we can discuss those. What is your misery in your life? What comfort do you think you might need to stand away from to do what you need to do in life? Think about the people in your life that you need to pull closer. And also the ones that you might need to separate yourself from. Not physically, just spiritually. Stop letting them manipulate you. And use you. And how you can stand against those things in your life. Those enemies of God. The true enemies of God. The things in our flesh that rise up. How we can say no to them. And tell them, no, we're not coming down. No, we're not walking away from this. Let's think about those four things as we go to small group. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for the opportunity tonight. I always am honored to be here with my people.
Lord, I hope they take something away from tonight that they can use and they can do in your name, God. None of this matters if it's not through you. Lord, I pray that if there's people sitting here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, that they'll feel comfortable asking us about that in a small group. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Lord, let us speak open tonight. Whether it opens wounds, opens hurts, let us be real with each other, Lord. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.